Dear participants, uh, my name is Dr. Julia Zions, and I have a great pleasure to welcome you at the 8th Euroblood.net's topic on Focus Cutaneous Lymphoma webinar. This session is a double session combining also the webinar which was planned for the 21st of December and which had to be rescheduled, unfortunately. And before we start, please be kindly informed that your microphones will be muted and uh, please switch off your cameras to maintain better streaming quality. And uh, please also make sure that you have entered your full name and surname in WebEx, uh, what is very important for receiving the educational points after attending the whole cycle of uh, webinars. And if you have any questions about the presentation, please write it in the chat. Uh, there will be a discussion at the end um, of the presentation. And you can find the chat under the cloud symbol and where you can see now a test message uh, from me. Dear audience, uh, please welcome with me today's speaker, uh, Professor Julia Skarisbeek, who will lead the session on new therapeutic developments part one and two. Professor Julia Skarisbeek is consultant dermatologist at the University Hospital Birmingham and leads the Cutaneous Lymphoma Service. She holds an honorary chair at the University of Birmingham at the Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy. She trained at the University Hospital London and St. Thomas Hospital and has been a consultant since 2004. Professor Skyris Brick is active in both clinical and molecular research fields for cutaneous lymphoma. She has a successful translational research program and is involved in the uh, development and delivery of both academic and commercial clinical studies. She's a chairman for the EORTC Cutaneous Lymphoma Task Force, chairman and trustee for the UK Photopheresis Society Charity, and treasurer of the International Society of Cutaneous Lymphomas. She has been published over 100 peer review articles, contributed to several books, and is involved in the development of clinical guidelines in cutaneous lymphoma. Professor Skaris Brick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as, as explained by Julia, I'm going to be separating the lecture into two parts. So part one, we're going to talk about staging in my case is fungoides because our treatments are stage dependent. Then we'll look at the guidelines and the stage related treatments. So we'll do that for my case is fungoides and cesare and then for CD30 T cell lymphoma. And then the second part, we'll be talking about the newly approved drugs, uh, Ladaga, Adcentris, and Religio. Uh, so, as I say, it's very important to understand staging in my case of Sangoides and Cesare syndrome because that really helps you select your treatments. And it's quite complicated, and unless you're doing it all the time with your patients, then you really need to refer to the table. And this is published in Blood 2007. So, Staging is composed of the TNMB classification, where T stands for skin, the tumor load in the skin, M stands for node, the nodal involvement, M for metastases, and B for blood involvement. The early stages are stage 1A to 2A, where 1A is those with less than 10% body surface area, either patch or plaque stage mycosis fungoides. 1B is where there's greater than 10% patch or plaque. And grade 2A is where there's nodal enlargement or early nodal involvement or dermatopathic nodes, but without effacement of the lymph nodes and without any tumours or rhipoderma. All of these stages can have blood involvement at B1, which is between 250 and 1,000 international units, or B0. The advanced stages are from 3A to 4B, sorry, for 2B to 4B, where 2B is those patients with tumours. The erythrodermic stages are from 3A to 4A1. These erythrodermic stages are split according to blood involvement, where 3A is B0 patients. 3B is patients with B1 blood involvement, as I mentioned, that's between 250 and a thousand international units of an aberrant lymphocyte population in the blood. 
And 4A1 is Cesare syndrome. So there's B2 greater than 1,000 international units and a circulating clone. 4A2 patients are those with any blood um, involvement, but with nodal effacement. And stage 4B are those with metastases. There are several guidelines, all are very similar. We have our British Association of Dermatology Guidelines published in 2018. We have our European ERTC guidelines, which were updated in 2017, European Journal of Cancer. And the NCCN guidelines are available online. These are the US guidelines. And they have the advantage of being online so that they're regularly updated. Early stage disease should be treated with skin directed therapy's first line. And this is common to all our guidelines. And what are those skin-directed therapies? Well, they include topical steroids, phototherapy with either ultraviolet B or PUVA, radiotherapy or topical nitrogen mustard or gel. If you have failure of the skin-directed therapies in early stage, you can move on to second-line options, and this includes bexarotene, interferon, or total skin electron B. It's important to understand when we talk about the first line options, you often choose several from this category before you move to second line options. So the second line options often are not the second line of treatment. There's often a number of treatments first. And for your second line options, you can move on to stage, um, similar treatments to stage 2B or tumor stage. So as I mentioned, take her message, this first line should be with skin-directed therapy. And you can choose which ones you use, whether you have localised treatments for um, small areas of 1A patients or small symptomatic areas, or whole body treatments, such as phototherapy or electron B. Promethine gel was recently approved by the EMA in 2017, and we'll talk about this in the second part of our lecture. It's a readily um, applicable gel to the skin, and you can apply it either to large surfaces or just to limited areas. Just to mention total skin electron beam, it is a skin-directed therapy. It treats the whole of the um, body surface area, and it's usually more effective than phototherapy. Traditionally, we gave this in a 30 gray in 20 fractions or similar um, radiotherapy dose, but more recently we've been using a low dose, and this is our paper which was published in uh, 2017 in the International uh, Journal of Radiation Oncology, where we treated over 100 patients with total skin electron beam at this low dose. There was less travel time, less skin reactions, and it has the advantage of being able to be repeated, although the duration of response was less. Of the 103 patients we treated in the UK, 18% had a complete response and 69% uh, had a partial response, so an excellent response rate. And the median duration of response was 11.8 months. The patients with early stage disease often live a long time and they are troubled throughout with their disease as there's no cure for early stage disease. So at times during their disease course, we may not be giving them any anti-CTCL therapy. And we call this expectant therapy. But expectant therapy doesn't mean do nothing, and patients can have symptomatic relief and palliation through supportive care. You may consider anti-itch medication, treatments with infections of the skin, pain relief, or psychological support. If you have failure of skin-directed therapy, what do you consider next? As I mentioned, if we look to our guidelines, once you've gone through the skin-directed therapy options, second line is bexarotene interferon or total skin electron B, or clinical trials if they're available. Bexarotene selectively binds and activates the nuclear retinoid X receptor, 
It was approved in Europe since 1999 for advanced stages of CTCL. It's given as an oral medication and we titrated up to 300 milligrams per meter squared. It has an excellent response rate between 40 to 67% and is higher in the early stage patients. And it has a good response by four weeks and maximum response by four months. Median duration response is around nine months and the main side effects are hyperlipidemia and central hypothyroidism. These can both be managed with um, either lipid lowering treatments or thyroxine replacement. Leukopenia can occur and sometimes requires uh, GCSF to boost the white cells. Interferon alpha has been a very promising treatment over the past two decades. However, recently the um, rofiron and intron A, the two types we tended to preference for our patients, have both been withdrawn from the market. So now we are using the Pegasus, which is the pegylated interferon alpha which is a once weekly injection. The response rates for interferon alpha at the three weekly dose was up to 88% in early stage disease and about 63% in more advanced stages. It can be safely combined with Puva as well and also combined with extra corporal photophoresis, particularly in those with lipidermic disease. Now, what happens if you have vexatin and interferon, total skin, as well as your skin directed, and you still have symptoms or troublesome lesions, which are refractory, then again, it's clinical trials or stage 2B options. And these are the stage 2B options. So you've got brentuximab, which is a, the CD30 um, antibody, which we'll be talking about later in the um, program or third-line options, which would be chemotherapy, um, clinical trials. So the principles of management of early-stage mycosis fungoides are to improve symptoms and quality of life, reduce tumour burden, and delay disease progression. The points to note is there's a long survival in early-stage mycosis fungoides, but with high symptom burden, can an occasional disease mortality does require tailored therapeutic strategies. Remember to improve quality of life, symptom control, supportive care, and always consider skin direct therapies before systemic. We'll now move on to treatment options for the advanced stages of the cases of angoides. As seen here, there's the tumor stage patients, the erythrodermic patients separated according to their blood tumor burden with 3A as those with B0 in their blood, stage 3B, those with B1, and stage 4A, B2, those with Cesare syndrome. Stage 4A2 are those with a face lymph nodes, and stage 4B are those with visceral disease. If you look at the overall survival of patients with um, advanced stage mycosis fungoides, it's very different. There's a much worse survival than in early stage disease with a median survival around three years. And you can see from this graph from the ProClippy data to the Prospective Cutaneous Lymphoma International Prognostic Index Study that the um, survival of those with 4A2 particularly tails off very quickly compared to those with 2B to 4A1 disease, and that was significant. The other important thing to consider, as well as the mortality, because this is an incurable disease, is the quality of life in our patients. And a recent study by um, Kevin Malloy with the ProClippy as a Skindex study in quality of life found that patients with advanced stage disease have a much worse quality of life than those with early stage disease. Other significant factors were it was worse in females and in those with alopecia. So let's look to the guidelines for those with advanced stage disease. 
as I said, it's split according to stage, and in my case, it's fungoides, to B, stage three, stage four, and two, stage four B, and as we'll see soon, sensory are all separately categorized. The other guidelines, as well as the European guidelines that we've looked at, are the um, NCCN, the American guidelines, and they are split slightly differently in advanced disease. Their systemic therapies are split and labeled systemic category A, systemic category B, suggested regimes for lifestyle transformation, and uh, for relapsed refractory disease requiring systemic therapy. So it's a slightly different approach. Um, I think in some ways it is preferred in the fact the terminology of systemic category A makes more sense when you're listing treatments, they're talking about first line, which can sometimes be confusing when you then go on to talk about second line, which could actually be the fifth or sixth um, type of treatment that patient has had. Uh, treatments are listed um, here in no particular alphabetical order um, according to the categories. And as I said, just with early stage disease, we also need to think about supportive symptomatic care, particularly as we've shown patients have a poorer quality of life in advanced disease. So depression um, can be a big problem with our patients, as well as infection, pruritus, and other skin symptoms. So looking first at patients with localised tumours, just because they're advanced disease doesn't mean you necessarily have to go in with a systemic therapy. If they have localised disease, then they could be treated with skin-directed therapy, and radiotherapy can have an absolutely excellent response, as shown here. We use fairly low doses of radiotherapy, either 8 gray in 2 fractions or 12 gray in 3 to 4 fractions, with an excellent response. Very occasionally you get radio resistance. Responses can take up to 8 weeks, and side effects are significant and include skin atrophy, telangiectasia, dispigmentation, and also an increased risk of other non-melanoma and possibly melanoma skin cancers. And this can be important in patients of a young age who may have a, a long life expectancy that they could go on to develop other tumours if you treat large areas with radiotherapy. Once a patient has widespread tumours, then you're really going to reach for their systemic therapies. Um, Brentuximab vedotin is available for those that have had a previous systemic. Single agent chemotherapy it's usually uh, referred further down the line to the immunotherapies like vexarity or interferon, and clinical trials are also an option. So brentoxamine was approved by the FDA in 2017 and by the um, European Union and EMA body. And the, uh, in Europe, it is licensed for the treatment of adult patients with CD30 positive cutaneous T cell lymphoma after at least one prior systemic therapy. And then it can receive up to 16 cycles. And again, we'll delve a little bit more detail into rintuximab in the second part of the lecture. Erythrodermic mycosis fungoides, what are our treatment options? Well, again, for the very early, uh, earlier stage, uh, the 3A without any blood involvement, you can still consider whole skin-directed therapy for these patients, either with phototherapy, or the burning can sometimes be a problem, or with total skin electron beam. So again, treatment options, um, as I mentioned, also include um, total skin, which also methotrexate, extracorporal photophoresis, interferon or vexarotene. And then moving on, second, third line to gemcitabin, mocoluzumab, tuzumab, rentuximab, clinical trials, or an allogeneic stem cell transplant if a patient is eligible and in a good durable remission. Sensory syndrome has its own pathway for treatment. So we can see here, uh, first line options, photophoresis, 
bexarotene and interferon. And these are sometimes given together in what we describe as triple therapy. Second line options include chemotherapy, alentuzumab, which is the anti-CD52 antibody, brentuximab, alginic central transplant in patients in Jordan remission or clinical trials. We also have um, newer options. So uh, third line we have for mogaluzumab um, in patients which says we can sometimes be pushed forward to second line. And there's a study ongoing of the anti-clear antibody in Telemac, the phase two trial in Europe. For patients with stage 4B or metastatic disease, again, they have slightly different treatment options. And chemotherapy is often um, given as a first-line option in these patients. So let's look a little bit about these later stage patients. These are patients with the face lymph nodes or metastatic uh, visceral disease. So this is the only group of patients which may be considered for first line treatment with a chemotherapy. Um, and this could either be single agent with gemcitabine or multi-agent chemotherapy such as CHOP or CHOAP, rituximab or clinical trials. The second line options such as further multi-agent chemotherapy, alginic stem cell transplant for patients in remission, or often just palliation if the patient um, it has a poor response to treatment, so symptom control. I just want to briefly talk about uh, stem cell transplantation. Who is eligible? Well, first of all, they need to be sit, fit for a stem cell transplant. They need to be in remission or a near CR, and they also have to consent to transplant and the consequences. This is the protocol that we use. It's the Stanford protocol, which was shared by Yong Kim. It's a non myeloablative transplant regime, and it doesn't have any chemotherapy. So patients are conditioned with a combination of total lymphoid irradiation, ATG, which is the anti-thymocyte antibody, and total skin electron B, with ECP if they have uh, accessory syndrome. And we recently published our cohort of patients from our university in Birmingham, where we transplanted 17 patients. This included 11 with mycosis fungoides, four with sensory syndrome, and two with um, anaplastic lifestyle lymphoma. Nearly half of the patients relapsed post-transplant. However, this tended to be a uh, very early stage relapse that we managed with skin-directed therapy, and only two patients had a terminal relapse. Transport-related mortality was low, to 6.7% at year one and 7.1% at year two, and really their disease was um, modified using and taking advantage of a graft versus lymphoma effect. The overall one-year survival was 86.7%, with a two-year survival of 78.6%. So the principles of management of advanced stage are slightly different from the early stage patients. Always remember to improve symptoms and quality of life. Try and delay progression. And aim for an allo stem cell transplant in first remission for eligible patients. Other key factors to remember is there's a longer survival in stage 2B to 3B disease. So treatments often don't need to be as aggressive as the 4A1 to 4B patients. Survival in patients with 4A2 is short and should be considered for a stem cell transplant. It should not be delayed in younger patients. And always consider immunotherapies before chemotherapy. To finish the first part of the lecture, I'd like to talk about the CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, lymphoma papulosis, and lifestyle plastic lymphoma. 
So the CD30 positive skin lymphomas must be differentiated between CD30 positive mycosis fungoides with large cell transformation, which is typically an aggressive disease. CD30 positive lymphomatoid papulosis is a benign relapse and remitting disease. You can see here with small papular necrotic lesions, which can be on the neutrophic scarring. As a plastic lifestyle lymphoma, you get larger, more tumid lesions. It has an excellent prognosis. Infirmative papulosis has different subtypes. So the common subtype, the A, is the CD30 positive type. But there's also type B with MF-like cells. Type C that has a very high number of CD30 positive cells and so forth. The most important thing is the um, treatment and the outcome doesn't depend on the type. So they all behave in a similar manner. So although the type is of academic interest, it does not have any prognostic importance for our patients. As I mentioned, it's a chronic recurrent scarring, papular necrotic eruption, typically presenting between 40 to 50 years, and 25% are associated with mycosis lingoides. Treatment is conservative, either puma or methotrexate, and there's 100% five-year survival. It may be associated, associated with the development of a second lymphoma in approximately 20% of patients. Here you can see again the papillary necrotic lesions on the back and the neurotrophic scarring. The CD30 positive lymphoma can be solitary or multiple lesions. They may have no previous MF or LYP, or they can be associated with it. Around 10% disseminate and can be serious. Treatment can be localised radiotherapy, or if there's multiple lesions, chemotherapy such as methotrexate or brintuximab. And then 10 year survival is 90%. So apart from these very few that disseminate, it has an excellent prognosis. And this is very different from a systemic CD30 positive um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma that can be a very aggressive disease. So in the skin, CD30 positive anaplastic lymphoma has a good prognosis, whereas nodal disease, de novo, um, has a very poor outcome. Now this is one of our patients with a uh, lesion on the hand and had an excellent response to radiotherapy. This is... Um, over five years ago, the patient has had no recurrence. CD30 positive disease is often a spectrum, so from the benign um, lymphoproliferative lesions to LYP to anaplastic lymphoma, and they can occur in the same patient, and they can have the same T cell clone. Treatments, um, as I mentioned, can be expectant, so do nothing. Skin directed therapy, so radiotherapy or phototherapy for more generalized lesions. No dose methotrexate or interferon. And in those with um, anaplastic lymphoma with multiple lesions or recurrent lesions, they can be considered for rituximab or chemotherapy. It's worth remembering that although systemic uh, disease is rare, uh, with a 90% 10 year survival, uh, recurrent cutaneous secondaries and uh, relapses are very common. So just to summarise the first part of the lecture, treatment is stage related. Early stage should be treated with skin directed therapy and advanced stages and refractory early stages may require systemic therapy. Select the therapy which best fits the individual's patient's needs. Most patients require multiple treatment modalities for the course of disease and aim to reduce tumour burden, prolong survival and improve quality of life. The second part will talk about the recently approved treatments for CDCL, which is clomethene gel, the DAGA, rintuximab, the dotin, or Edcentris, and mobilizumab, which is the Tilegio. These have all been approved over the last three years. But first looking at clomethene gel or DAGA, this has been present in the US for much longer as Valclon. It's exactly the same formulation, it just has a different um, name. 
And it's one of the reasons for that is the uh, license indication in Europe is slightly different. So in Europe, it is licensed for the topical treatment of mycosis fungoides CTCL in adult patients. So that's all stages of disease, not just early stages. And it's received this um, approval due to the uh, pivotal study, which is the Lesson trial in 2013. And this was a non-inferiority trial where it compared the clomethene gel to the ointment that was previously in circulation. 260 patients were randomised for once daily treatment of the gel or ointment and 130 patients were in each arm. Similar number discontinued, so 40 discontinued in the gel arm and 35 in the ointment arm, and mainly due to skin reactions. The primary efficacy endpoint was the Kales response. And if we look um, here, you can see that in the, um, in the gel, the CR was 14%, the 45% PR, and with the ointment, the CR was 12%, with the 36% PR, um, which is slightly higher in the gel arm, um, but it was not significantly higher, um, but it did show that it wasn't inferior, which was the end point of this trial. So it was a success, and it was a success in um, early stages as well as the advanced stages. So the conclusions were CL gel was shown to be a non-inferior to the CL ointment. There's a longer duration of treatment with CL gel and an increased response rate. The main side effect was skin irritation, which did result in a number of patients withdrawing from treatment. There were no serious adverse effects. There were no detectable levels of chlorophyll gel in the blood and there's no increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancers. So looking at the different stages of how you may be using a chlorometal gel, um, you can apply it to patches and plaques in 1A patients. You can just apply it to the affected areas, which would give you with one 60 gram tube, approximately two months of treatment. It must be stored in the fridge, and it must be stored in a child tamper-proof bag. In those with small widespread disease, you can apply all over affected areas, not just to the patches and plaques. Again, it's a once daily treatment and it can be continued for 12 months. In the advanced stages, it tends to be used on the patches of plaques of patients with advanced stages um, or with patients who are lipidermic. Um, and so, for example, this patient. Uh, could receive radiotherapy to this tumour and uh, chlorophyll gel to the patches and plaques. So that's chlorophyll gel. Um, it's used in early and advanced stages, but what else is approved for advanced stages? Well, we have two other drugs, Bruntaxamid, Bredotin and Mogulizumab. So uh, uh, Bruntaxamid, Bredotin or Adcentris, is a drug antibody conjugate. It's an anti-CD30 monoclonal antibody with a protease achievable linker to uh, the dotin, which is a, a toxin. So the drug binds to the CD30 positivity of the lymphoma cells. And this is an aberrant CD30 positivity in lymphoma, so it's not seen in normal lymphocytes. So it specifically attacks the tumor cells. It hooks onto the edge and allows the, the dotin, the toxic portion to be uh, enter into the cell and cause cell apoptosis and cell death. And as I mentioned, it received its FDA and e EMA approval in 2017. The treatment of adult patients with CD30 positive cutaneous T cell lymphoma after at least one past systemic therapy and to receive up to 16 cycles. And these patients um, don't have to have a specific level, percentage level of CD30. The trial which led to its approval is the Alcanza trial. 
And in this trial, patients had a greater than 10% of CD30 positivity. But we have since shown that patients with um, 5 to 10% also have a, a response to brintuximab. And certainly in the UK, we are considering patients with greater than 5% CD30 positivity. So the Alcantara trial was a phase three randomized study comparing the efficacy and safety of brintuximab for dotin and CD30 positive MF or primary cutaneous anaplastic lifestyle lymphoma versus physician's choice of either methotrexate or bexaritine. And these options were given because uh, some patients would have already had uh, bexaritine, so they didn't have met methotrexate, and um, some patients with uh, CD30 positive anaplastic lifestyle lymphoma may do better with uh, methotrexate over bexaritine. So it gave some flexibility. Uh, patients were treated with brintuximab, 1.8 milligrams a kilogram, intravenously every three weeks, and were given 16 cycles. 128 patients were enrolled. Um, the median age of patients was uh, 62 in a brintuximab arm and 59 in the physician's choice arm. ECOG score was uh, tended to be between 0 to 1 in greater than 90% of patients in both groups. And the median CD30 expression was 33%, so quite high, but this is slightly skewed by those with anaplastic large lymphoma who tended to have near 100% um, positivity. And it included uh, both early and advanced mycosis fibroides as well as primary cutaneous and a plastic large cell lymphoma. Patients had a median of four prior therapies in a brintuximab arm and three and a half in the physician's choice arm. The primary endpoint of the Alcantara trial was the ORR4. It's a slightly uh, confusing terminology and it was something new as a primary endpoint, but actually it's quite straightforward. It means a response lasting at least four months. So some patients with mycosis fungoides sometimes have a response which fluctuates. So this uh, endpoint was that a response had to at last a minimum of four months to be counted as a response. And the OR4 was 56% in the brituxab arm versus just 13% in physician's choice, which is highly significant. 16% of patients had CRs which is better than the physician's choice at 2%. Progression-free survival was improved at 16.7 months versus just three and a half months in physician's choice. And there was also an improvement in the skin deck scores measuring quality of life. Safety data were consistent with the established tolerability profile. Here you can see that uh, the quality of life was improving the blue line with brintuximab vedotin more than the physician's choice. And here we can look at the commonly reported adverse effects. The thing that screams out at everybody, which most of you are probably aware of, is the peripheral neuropathy seen with brintuximab vedotin, which is rarely seen with physician's choice. This was seen in over 60% of patients of brintuximab vedotin. It tended to be stage, uh, it tended to be a grade one or grade two neuropathy, and it tended to reverse on stopping or dose reduction. The other um, grades of um, toxicity were similar for both nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, vomiting, alopecia, pruritus, pyrexia, and decreased appetite, with the exception of hypotrotosphidemia seen with vexarity. One of our patients having an excellent response to brintuximab. This is another patient who had a good response to brintuximab, first of all, in trial, and then um, 2016 with a CR, 2018 relapsed, and again had a good partial response to brintuximab second time round. So, as with many of our treatments, it's a very unusual disease. Um, uh, MF and Cesare in the fact that you can go back with the same treatments. So if you've had a good response to, uh, for example, bexaritine and the patient does well, they come off it, 
they can go back on it in the future, same with interferon, uh, phototherapy, um, they all tend to cycle through treatments. So just because they've had them once doesn't mean they can't have it again. So where should brintactamab be placed in management? You can see here, it's a second line option. Its license is after one failed systemic therapy. The last drug I want to mention today before finishing is mogulizumab. This is a humanized, uh, fucosylated monoclonal antibody targeting the CC hemokine receptor 4, the CCR4, also designated CD194. And it has been approved in Japan since 2012 for a treatment of relapsed or refractory uh, ATCLL. Uh, in 2014, it was uh, approved for cutaneous T cell lymphoma in Japan. In 2018, it was granted FDA approval. And 2018, the EMA granted approval uh, for the treatment of adult patients with MF or Sesame syndrome, having received at least one prior systemic therapy. And the trial which uh, showed efficacy of mogulizumab and allowed it to be uh, grant approval was the Maverick trial. And this is the largest ever trial in CCL. 372 patients were randomized, 59 centers across 11 countries. And treatment was administered on an outpatient basis. It was uh, in stage 1b to 4b, histologically confirmed MF or sesame patients, with the exclusion of large cell transformation. Mogulizumab was given one milligram per kilogram intravenously, weekly for the first five weeks, and then every two weeks. And it's randomized one to one with oral varinostat, with a one way crossover for either progressive disease or intolerability to varinostat. And unlike the Alcanza trial, which I mentioned, the uh, endpoint was the OR4, the response rate lasting four months. The primary endpoint for Maverick was the progression free survival. And that was 7.7 .7 months in the Mogulizumab arm versus just 3.1 months in the uh, Varinostat arm. And this was highly significant. The overall response was 28% in the Mogulizumab arm and 4.8% in the physician's choice arm. So in summary, this was first report of a randomized phase three study evaluating progression through survival as a primary endpoint. It was the largest randomized controlled trial in CCL of 364 patients. And Mogluzumab had a superior efficacy compared to Varistat with a progression free survival of 7.7 months versus just 3.1 months. The most common side effects were drug rash, infections, including upper respiratory tract infections and skin infections, infusion-related reaction, which tended to get better through the cycles, headache, fatigue, peripheral edema, pyrexia, and GI disorders. Patient reported uh, quality of life as measured by skin dex, showed better symptom reduction and improved function status in favour of mogulizumab. And this study supported its use in CCL patients. So where should it be placed in the management? Well, as third line options in early stage and advanced stages, but should be considered as a second line option in patients with sensory syndrome. So just to summarize the recent treatments we've discussed, um, where clomethane gel approved in Europe 2017 can be used in early stages, patch or plot, or as an adjuvant in advanced disease. Protaxman pedotum, the CD30 positive cutaneous T cell lymphoma and lifestyle plastic lymphoma. And mogulizumab approved in 2018, a second line for cesarean or third line in relapsed refractory CCL. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scaris Brick, for this uh, great uh, presentation. I would like to invite also participants to ask questions in the chat.
Yes, I can. <laughs> is there still a role of H tax and CCL? Um, from uh, Alexandra Alio. Um, so we don't have an HTAC inhibitor that is licensed in Europe. Um, they do have two in the US, so they've got um, Varinostat and Romidepsin. Um, Varinostat obviously didn't show a particularly high um, efficacy recently in the Maverick trial. However, it does have a use in patients and it's another option to def- I would place it with vexarity and interfere on for patients with refractory early stage disease or with tumor stage disease. Um, Robidepsin is uh, slightly more efficacy um, and maybe better in the more advanced or widespread disease with the high tumor burden. It also has a slightly higher um, risk of side effects or particularly those with cardiac history. So yes, they are useful. Um, in, the, in Europe, we have uh, the Resumin trial, which is a maintenance trial looking at resumin stat um, as a maintenance therapy in patients who've had a response or stable disease to a prior therapy to see whether this can um, improve the response duration. So I think, yes, it does have a role. And unfortunately, we don't have anything in our bag in Europe at the moment. Um, another question has come through. Uh, what treatments will you combine with promethine gel? Um, it's fairly safe to combine m- most treatments. Um, so it depends uh, what the patient's disease burdens like. So if they have a uh, radiotherapy to tumours, you could be using it for patches and plaques. Um, if they've got, if they're on something like vexarity or interferon, and there's some areas. Uh, that are low grade, that aren't responding, they could have it. Similarly, patients on chemotherapy, sometimes you find that the aggressive um, lesions with large cell transformation melt away with the chemo, but the lower grade patches and plaques don't. So it could be used there. So there's there's several options, um, bearing in mind that one tube is quite expensive. If you're using it as an adjuvant therapy, it means you can um, spread out and, and, you, and one tube will last a bit longer if some of the other lesions have been treated with other therapies. Um, uh, what ECP regime do you usually use and do you change it in the COVID era? So um, we're just actually looking at what's happened to our patients in COVID. Certainly some patients um, stopped their photophoresis but we didn't stop anybody on photophoresis. We were um, enforced by the hospital that we had to stop all clinical trials. Um, so all clinical trials were stopped, but no treatments that were um, licensed and approved were stopped. So photophoresis was continued, but a small number of patients chose to shield. Um, and all of those have now restarted. Um, I would consider um, reducing um, the schedule of ECP if the patient wished. Uh, often we treat patients twice a month with um, a cycle, uh, two consecutive days. But we could consider going to monthly if the patient wanted to reduce their hospital admission visits. It is a requirement of our hospital that all our patients coming in for treatment have to have a COVID swab within three days of their treatment. So. Obviously, these patients have to come up, have a COVID swab, go home, and then as long as it's negative, they can come back for treatment. So it's quite onerous on their time. I have another question now. Uh, do you believe pegylated interferon has the same spectrum of activity as rofiron? So um, my personal experience with pegylated interferon is small. I've only just started using it. Um, previously, I was um, I would always have used um, rofiron or intron A. Um, but as these aren't available, uh, we have had our hand forced. For, for some centres um, who I've spoken with who have been using it, and certainly some uh, data came out of Germany, suggesting it did have a similar efficacy. So um, personal experience is a wait and see. We don't have any other choices. Interferon is an excellent treatment for our patients and very valuable for patients as triple therapy with cesarean combining it with vexarity and ECP, so I would be very keen to um, keep it, and I'm hoping that uh, pegylated interferon will show itself to be effective. Um, <clears throat> so something's come now. Uh, 
When do you decide to switch to Brentuximab um, once a month to once every three months uh, after pharmacy? Uh, it's a very uh, important question because we have our hands tied in the UK because we are only allowed to give 16 cycles and we are not allowed to delay or miss more than one cycle. So if you gave five cycles, you couldn't then delay three months before you gave it again. Um, you're not allowed a retreatment. Uh, so this is um, frustrating because I think that it is a drug which, um, because of the toxicity with the neuropathy, it's very useful to stop and start, to eke out uh, time between uh, cycles and reduce the dose. Um, how would I do that? Would I bark to a patient? Not necessarily. I'd probably do that on clinical um, uh, symptoms and uh, MSWOT score and how the patient is feeling and the toxicity from the neuropathy. So um, out of trial, I rarely re a patient um, if they've got um, a good response to treatment. My main indications for biopsying is if the tumour is resistant. Um, certainly, uh, I, sometimes you can see a squamous cell carcinoma or a BCC instead of a, a tumour MF, so that's always something to be aware of. If a patient has a tumour that's not responding, is it MF or is it something else? So that would make me want to biopsy it. Um, but I don't tend to biopsy out of trial my responders. Um, I would look at them clinically. Um, another question has come through. Uh, is there currently any role for alimtuzumab in cesare? Um, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, so alimtuzumab um, is the anti-CD52 antibody um, we use it as a low-dose subcut, and I think that it is a very good uh, treatment for cesare, but it does have a very highly immunosuppressive uh, uh, tolerability profile. So it's not something I reach for, and particularly in COVID times, we get a little bit nervous about immunosuppressing people further. I think it does have a role, but I think with some of the newer antibodies coming out, um, like Bobolizumab, that it's probably less preferred. And I think of it, although it is an antibody, I think of it more um, as a, a with sort of chop or chill up in that sort of really suppressive uh, category. Uh, another question has come through about my experience with anti PD1. Um, I've just started treating patients with pembrolizumab in trial. Uh, we have a trial of pembrolizumab uh, which is combined with uh, radiotherapy. Um, it appears to be very good. I think we're all a little bit nervous with pembrolizumab, with the melanoma experience initially of patients getting the um, autoimmune responses. And now we're very sure of how to treat these patients. I think we can be a bit uh, more confident. And so far, um, my clinical experience has been very good. Patients can get a tumour flare, so they can get a slight worsening of their skin as the disease melts away. So that's something to be aware of that um, if they do have a worsening of their disease, just make sure that that is um, not a tumour flare. You may want to bark to a patient in that instant. Probably time for one more question and another one's come through. So um, how do you manage the contact allergic dermatitis sacrobutical methyl gel? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I tend to reduce the frequency of treatments um, as opposed to using steroids. I think there may be some beneficial um, reaction. So first of all, just to say that I actually think the truly allergic dermatitis, um, if they have a true allergy and blistering, they should have it withdrawn. But most of the um, reactions, I don't think are too allergic. Um, I think they're more of a um, sensitivity reaction. And I think they're probably seen more frequently in high responders. So um, you shouldn't be put off using those patients, treating those patients, but do dose reduce, um, uh, you can go down to once a week. And if you still can't tolerate it, you could consider topical steroids, but I would use that as a last resort. But the truly allergic patients should have it withdrawn. but I think that's probably uh, less than 5% of patients. So we've got a question saying, uh, how long is it reasonable to use the Daga um, if there's a partial but not complete improvement after several months of treatment? Um, most of our treatments only result in partial responses. So absolutely, if a patient is deriving clinical benefit, 
I think it's very important that they keep treatment with clomethrin gel, but also with other treatments. Unfortunately, we very rarely get a complete response. So I always say, you know, aim for um, a reduction in skin tumor burden and an improved quality of life. And as long as you've got those two things, whether you hit the magic 50% um, for uh, to get a partial response, I don't think it matters. But the patient should be deriving clinical benefit. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Scaris Brick, um, for leading this great session on new therapeutic developments. And uh, thank you very much, audience, for your participation. Before we go, I have some um, information. Please do not forget to fill in the survey we'll send you after this uh, webinar. It's important for uh, getting um, points and the certificate um, at the end of the uh, sessions. Uh, for those of you who attended all eight webinar sessions and you're interested in receiving a continuous medical educational points, please register your account on uh, the website of the European Board of Accreditation in Hematology using the same email address as for registering to our webinars. Uh, and based on our verification and list of participants, um, IBAH will award you with the seven continuous medical educational points confirmed by official certificate. And parallelly of course, we'll contact those of you who attended all webinars and provide you with uh, all the details, uh, instructions on how to proceed uh, to receive certificate with points. So don't worry if you if you missed some information uh, today or, or you will not uh, be sure how to proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Skarisbrick and uh, audience uh, for your presence at the Eurobloodnet topic on focus. And especially in these uh, hectic times, uh, it was uh, really um, great to, to, to have you. And I would like to invite you to other free Eurobloodnet webinar program starting in 2021, which is Thursday webinars uh, with mixed topics in, uh, uh, in the field of rare blood diseases. Topic on focus, uh, TMAs for health professionals and uh, topic on focus, cutaneous lymphoma, addition for patients, advocates and patients organizations. Uh, so to stay updated with all the initiatives, please subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook and Eurobloodnet at the YouTube channel where we publish all the webinar sessions. Uh, thank you very much. And on behalf of Eurobloodnet, I wish you a peaceful holiday season and I look forward to see you in 2021. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.